Hello everyone and welcome back to Brewmasters. This week we're speaking to one of the titans of tabletop and board game design, none other than Steve Jackson. For the uninitiated, Mr. Jackson is the mind behind The Fantasy Trip, GURPS, Munchkin, Ogre, Melee, Ninja Burger and the Dice series, as well as the founder of Steve Jackson Games. He once hilariously beat the Secret Service in court. Uh, you should look that one up, it's a good story. Before that though, it has of course been a while since I've worked on anything involving Brewmasters. This will sadly be the first of the last three interviews that I recorded for the show. The reason why things are coming to a close is in part due to my circumstances changing. With Covid in the way, I haven't been able to run or play any games with my usual crew, and with TTRPGs leaving my routine and life, I'm going through something of a dice dry spell at the moment. It happens to all of us at one time or another. So while it might be my focus again someday and there's plenty more conversations to be had, for now at least I'm more focused on creating than discussing. Of course, I deeply appreciate all of the love everyone's shown for the channel and I hope that you enjoy these final three talks. First up is of course Mr. Jackson who had limited time to spare, so this one will be a bit shorter. Uh, but we have a couple of longer discussions coming up on the topics of live action roleplay and then we're going back to basics and talking 5e homebrew to close out the show. So without further ado, let's dive into today's conversation. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for joining me. I really appreciate you spending the time. Oh, my pleasure. Let's get down to it. Um, I'm curious, uh, how has your approach to design changed over the years? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I'm not sure it has, really. Like you always follow the same kind of code of conduct? As it were. I assume you're being metaphorical. And I'm really not... I mean, I haven't done any conscious changes. I'm still making up games. I'm not, I'm not claiming to have learned nothing over the years... But it's uh, evolutionary, not revolutionary. I see. So, yeah, you've been largely self-taught, is that right? Completely. There was, there was no, uh, no curriculum back in the 1970s. Yeah, I mean, even these days, it's very hard to find any kind of resources that really teach you anything. Um, we largely have to go by uh, situations like this where we can talk to the previous generation who have gone through it and try and learn from their mistakes. <laughs> right. So I think one thing I've heard a lot is how much designers hate it when people ask if a game is fun because it's such a nebulous term and that means like something completely different to each person. Um, are there particular metrics that you think are worthwhile measures for how good a game is? I don't think that I would have much sympathy with people who don't like being asked if the game is fun. Isn't that the first question? If it's not fun, why is the box open? If they're not shooting for fun, I don't know what they're shooting for. <laughs> it's a totally fair point. You play a game to be social with your friends and to take you out of yourself for a little while. It kind of needs to be fun. For sure. I think, um, I suppose the critique comes in that fun in, in itself is unique to each person. Um, so I don't suppose there's a consistent kind of measure to it that you could say, well, this kind of fun will be fun for everyone. Or do you disagree with that? Oh, no. Everybody has different ideas. You can't just uh, assign a number to each game and say it's that much fun. Although Board Game Geek tries to. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's why we have so many different games is because different people enjoy different things. That's, that's a truism. For sure. I mean, there's a beautiful amount of variety in the industry at the moment. Are there any particular games that you've been um, seeing from more modern uh, designers that you've been particularly att attracted to? I want to play Terraforming Mars many more times. What is it about the game that interests you? Well... I'm crazy about the subject, which always helps for me. Uh, it would be harder for me to get involved in a game about chartered accounting or catching mice just because <laughs> there's no room for, for my 
imagination and my mental role playing there. I like the huge variety of cards, and I like the way the board develops in a somewhat predictable but not completely predictable manner. Hmm. I suppose the closest I've come to gameplay of that sort is maybe in the vein of Mansions of Madness. Is that something you're familiar with? I have watched it played. I've never played it. Okay. There's that uh, play style of like um, the sort of having consistent pieces, but being able to play completely new with them every time. Does that appeal to you? Yes. I mean, uh, I like to have variety when I open the box. Now, it's not true that every game has to be infinitely repeatable to be a good game or worth buying. If you've ever seen Campaign for North Africa? I'm aware of it. (laughs) Oh, okay. It's an old SBI title. It's a classic. Playing that once is sufficient, and then you have your money's worth. Isn't that the game that's supposed to be like one of the most complicated ever made or something? (laughs) It's one of the largest ever made. I don't know about the most complicated, although it's up there. It's very much a simulation. Yeah, doesn't it take like a a very long time, like months to play? Uh, Yes. Assuming you're not quitting work and devoting yourself completely to the game, you could easily spend months at it. I suppose that asks a great deal of the player. Is that something you'd ever think of repeating in something that you make? Well, a good role-playing campaign will last months, if not years. It's just how you want to spend your time. (laughs) That's true. I hadn't really thought about it that way. So I suppose it'd be interesting to know, what was it like for you to transition from being like a designer to being a businessman? Uh, Traumatic. Oh, no. (laughs) On the other hand, uh, this all happened when I was very young, and it was all part of just exploring the world and what I could do with it. But running my own business was very unlike watching someone else run theirs. Hmm. So, yeah, I never had any business courses in school, and sometimes I feel the lack. Yeah, it can't be easy just having to learn all that stuff without, like, going through any kind of a course. Although I have the impression from people who have taken business courses that they're not about starting your own business. And did you find that as you transitioned to running a business that you had less opportunity to be a designer? Uh, That is very true. It's only in the past 10 years or so with Phil Reed coming in as CEO that I have had as much design time as I would like. Mm, That's consistent with other stories I've heard from more contemporary designers going along the same path. A couple of the guests we've had on the show. Even Gary Gygax uh, found that to be true at TSR. Oh, yeah. And... I mean, for anyone who's even remotely familiar with his story, like, as you say, traumatic. (laughs) And not everyone makes the transition, which is why we see so many new game companies fail, even if they have a good game. I was thinking that, um, yeah, like capitalist ventures tend to be very... um... Predatory. Sure, yeah, predatory works as well. Well... In this business, you're not competing against the other people who do games like yours. You're competing against Nintendo for what kind of game people want to play. Hmm. No, I try to be as collegial as I can toward other tabletop designers, and that's usually reciprocated. Yeah, I do find that outside of at least the Dungeons & Dragons sort of region of TTRPGs, there is a rising tides raise all ship sort of mentality. Well, and even D&D, or perhaps especially D&D, raises all our ships. Um, whether that would be to everyone's preference or not, that's just what happens. That's fair. And I suppose I am a little biased towards Wizards of the Coast just because it doesn't feel like a business of their magnitude has any reason to contribute to the community at large. Yes, and it is a magnitude issue. That's the right word. It's hard for them to participate in the environment because to a large extent, they are the environment. Mm. Well, they're definitely doing really well with 5th edition, uh, at least in terms of like bringing on 
new players and introducing new people to the TTRPG world. And I find that, from my experience at least, most people do end up branching out into other games and discovering the wider ecosphere. Yes. You you can hardly help eventually becoming aware that there are other games. And then you ask yourself, might they be fun? Hmm. And then we've got you. <laughs> Absolutely. And obviously, having worked on GURPS, uh, well, created GURPS, um, GURPS has been hugely in- influential, left a massive impact on the TTRPG market. Um, would you, or are you maybe considering 5th edition? Always considering new editions, but there has to be enough motivation. We went almost 20 years between 3rd and 4th. Hmm. It's uh, when we do a new edition, it's not for marketing reasons. It's because we now know enough to do something that is enough better to be worth the trouble that it puts everyone to us and the gamers. That's sensible. I mean, there's definitely other game companies which don't seem to have the same perspective. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I'm aware. <laughs> To, to be polite and not naming names. <laughs> no, no, it would serve no purpose to call out Hasbro and Games Workshop. That would just be wrong. <laughs> Who would do such a thing? Then I suppose uh, the question that some of the audience may be interested in is if you maybe were to do a fifth edition, uh, how you might retool it for a modern audience. It would be less crunchy. That's clear. Hmm. GURPS fourth edition was notably more complex and had more moving parts than third edition. And that was what the market was asking for at the time. It's not what the market is asking for now. We make things for people to play. There's no use in not listening to the market. I don't mind doing something a little unexpected, but it it can't be so unexpected that people won't try it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's only to be said for being experimental, but certainly not at the expense of actually making something that people want. (laughs) Unless you're on Kickstarter and printing in Asia and have a lot of free time, in which case you might as well. And then who knows, you might come up with Mork Borg. (laughs) Oh yeah, one of the old school revival games, right? Yes. Well, it's old school revival. It's very, very self-consciously grimdark hilariously grimdark. <laughs> I've only seen like bits and pieces of it from um, the design perspective of uh, the book itself, uh, like the graphic design. The graphic design is incredibly adventurous. Mm. I was using it as um, one of the examples of layouts when I was talking to someone about something that I'm working on. And it was interesting in that it breaks a lot of the design rules of just reading the book. Like it's not interested in leading your way in a way around the page that would make sense for picking up the rules. It's much more interested in like the imagery that it's displaying to you. Correct. I mean, it's, that's not something that I would have set out to do, but my, they succeeded. Hmm. Yeah. It seems to have become like quite popular. Is old school revival something you'd ever think about getting involved with? Oh, I already am. Uh, Fantasy Trip was an old school game um, of of the real old school when it launched in the late 70s. And bringing it back, we did not try to modernize anything except uh, some of the language. Following what you were talking about now, and I'm sorry, Okay, that's right. The audience wasn't here. You were asking me about pronouns, and I just I I, mi- I misheard pronouns as pronounce, and then then completely went down a rabbit hole when you were asking me what pronouns I wanted to use. Uh, at, at any rate, uh, the original edition of the fantasy trip material was all he, him, unless there was a specific named female character. That was uh, how it was done back then. And one of the things that we worked on for re-release was, okay, that's not the way we talk now. Yeah, it's definitely interesting the way that 
TTRPG language has to evolve with the times as well. I mean, we've seen from 4th edition D&D just how much that can impact the success of a game. Um, an old edition, I don't remember the number, but an old edition of Tunnels and Trolls had some spell names that were you know, quite funny by the standards of the time they were written, which was right after D&D. They're less funny now. And the design team that put out the new edition quite properly went in and excised those. That's very encouraging to hear. Uh, this is now. Hmm. But uh, to return to your question, uh, old school, yes, I'm all about it. My, my old school is not the D&D old school, but it's definitely old school style play. For sure. I suppose, well, just for the sake of the audience, um, how would you define old school in as much as like what separates it from more contemporary games? Find the monster, kill the treasure, wash, rinse, repeat. You don't have to worry nearly as much about the Freudian issues of the second assistant villain's mother-in-law and a whole lot more (laughs) about what he's doing with that short sword. I see. So it's foregoing the modern sort of approach of being much more heavily role play intensive. Yes, you can still you can still role play like mad, but you don't you don't forget that you're in a fantasy game. That's what we're here for. Hmm. And would you say that it's innately grimdark, or was that just like something that you can have? Uh, oh, Mortborg was the one I was saying was grimdark. Fantasy trip is very deadly. But it's uh, in style of presentation, it's classic low fantasy. Good things can happen. Okay. And often the party is the agent of the good things happening because there is always another crazy necromancer to deal with. And who's going to protect <laughs> the townsfolk if it's not you? For sure. And is like world building approached in a simpler way than you would in more, more contemporary games? Much simpler. The world is generic low fantasy, and the background is written to explicitly allow and encourage any GM's uh, world to drop in wherever they want on the edge of the map. So yeah, I'm definitely feeling like it's uh, conjuring those like classic 80s fantasy images of like the Conan the Barbarian. Um, yes, uh, uh, it, it would work perfectly well with a Fritz Lieber world, for instance. Yeah, Conan didn't have any really heroic wizards in that particular genre. Wizards were something to be fed cold steel and disposed of. <laughs> but you can have player character wizards in Fantasy Trip. I love how bluntly you put that. <laughs> Would you be able to share with us maybe some of the biggest lessons that you've learned in your career as a designer? Playtest. Then playtest some more. (laughs) Then playtest with different people. Then listen to your playtesters. Because if your reaction to that playtesting is, oh, they were playing it wrong. Uh, No, no. Uh, If they were playing it wrong, it's your responsibility to do something about that. Explain it better or change your expectations. Probably some of the best advice we've had. (laughs) Yes, it needs to be part of your routine when you make a game. How does it work when it's exposed to the real world? You know the joke about no battle plan survives contact with the enemy? No first draft survives contact with the players. (laughs) Yeah, I think we were speaking to... um... Uh, Stephen Radney McFarland um, works on, uh, I think it was some of the D&D and Pathfinder games. Um, He was talking about how iteration is like super important. Yes. I'm also a big believer in proofreading. It's amazing the meaning changers that can get in there. Just in terms of like general grammar or more like in terms of the um, rules wordings? Uh... Well, every single character should be the one that you intended to type and, and not the wrong number or the wrong word. And with uh, autocorrect on everybody's computer these days, getting in the wrong word is more possible than ever. And then you mm. just have gibberish. 
Yeah, the value of copy editing can't be overstated. Exactly. And it has to be copy editing that is willing to use the machine but doesn't depend on it. So I suppose then, how do you feel about errata? Uh, we hate them, we do, but we always publish errata when we find errors. There's a very up-to-date errata page for Fantasy Trip, for instance, because mm. the original book was many pages long and there there have been uh, there have been supplements now we are currently keeping the fantasy trip book in print to, via pod so we update that file whenever anything significant is discovered so everybody who buys a new copy gets the quote unquote latest edition Fortunately, it's been a while since anything important was discovered. That's fair. And as you say, nothing comes out completely perfect the first time. Right. I'm also willing to go farther on errata and actually do a rules change if it turns out that we saw print with something that just isn't working right. Hmm. It's not just a matter of this number is wrong or this word is wrong. Sometimes the rule is wrong. Fix it. 100%, yeah. I I worked in the games industry for a short while, and uh, sorry, I should keep clarifying video games. Yeah, I don't think there was a single game I worked on, regardless of how long we tested it or how much we tried to mess with it. The moment that it makes contact with the public, they're going to find things you couldn't even dream of. (laughs) They're going to break it and break it and break it. Mm. And then they're going to communicate with their friends on the internet, and soon the mistake will be more widely known than the game. <laughs> because that's what players do. Yeah, yeah. Like the mimetic quality of uh, mistakes is uh, forced to be reckoned with in modern times. It is. I think um, one of the things that I've heard about GURPS, I'm, I have to admit I haven't actually played the game myself, Um, but I understand that it's supposed to be able to be played single player. Is that right? That's not one of its big attributes. Uh, Fantasy Trip is actually better for that. We did release a solo for GURPS. I guess over the years there have been several, but I wouldn't call it a huge sale point. It's, uh, I think GURPS is better with the Game Master. Do you think the single player TTRPGs is anything you might like more heavily investigate? Well, Fantasy Trip is going more that direction. We've already published, I think, more more words of solo for Fantasy Trip than we ever did for GURPS because it's it's a, a simpler rule set and a lot of the decisions you make are tactical, which uh, which plays very well to a solo game. Hmm. Did working on board games come naturally to you, or was that something that you had to really strive to put the effort towards? I started with board games. My first uh, game design was Ogre, which is uh, a hex-based war game. Oh, uh, yeah, like more focused on like miniatures. Uh, we reduced, uh, reduced. We produced a miniature version later. The original was uh, just with cardboard chits. Okay, making it much more affordable, I imagine. It was a $2.95 game. Wow. And have you experienced there's a lot of overlap in designing for board games compared to tabletop RPGs? Actually, yes. Uh, the, The elements of design are pretty much the same. Now, you have to be or hire a fiction writer at some point to produce a role-playing game, but design, I think, is design. Hmm. So there's definitely a lot of transferable skills there. I thought so. So uh, given your experience in the industry, uh, would you have any advice for people who are just now getting into tabletop design? Um, Other than playtest madly? Well, Kickstarter can be your friend, just don't get in over your head with stretch goals. Uh, Kickstarter is a potential solution to your financing problems if you can be persuasive enough about the game that you're working on. Yeah, and we've seen a few horror stories now that Kickstarter has been around for long enough of people getting way in over their heads or 
not being able to live up to the goals that they've set for themselves. Yes. I'm coming up on a time deadline. That's no problem. I mean, I'm actually, I think I've run through all of the questions that I had prepared. Obviously, very much appreciate your time. Thank you. Again, my pleasure. I want to see more people getting into game design and making neat stuff so I can play it. Well, take care, Nick. No problem. Have a nice evening. You too. A special thank you again to Mr. Jackson for spending his time with us. If you'd like to check out any of the hundreds of amazing games that he's produced over the years, head on over to sjgames.com or check out thefantasytrip.game for his latest TTRPG. Join us next time when we'll be discussing live action roleplay and the unique challenges posed by DMing in three dimensions as I talk with Liv from the Dead River Company. Until the next adventure, stay safe.